Hi, I'm Skip George, and I'm at the Postural Restoration Institute in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I wanted to talk to chiropractors about applying PRI principles to their everyday chiropractic practice. You know, we adjust spines. And how we determine what we're, we're going to adjust is by history examination, perhaps palpation, x-ray, motion palpation. And today I wanted to talk about perhaps another way of looking at your treatment application. I teach a course called Postural Respiration. And one of the most important issues in terms of determining position of a pelvis, of a spine, of a neck, is the shape of the diaphragm. You know, breathing's a big topic in rehabilitation and performance. And so, my attempt is to impress upon you the importance of, number one, thinking diaphragm. The diaphragm really will determine, and breathing, will determine the position of pelvis, the position of thoracic spine, the position of the neck. And when you're looking at a neck, consider a couple things. For instance, accessory muscles with breathing, the scalenes. Oftentimes, especially on the right side of a neck, the scalenes will become accessory muscles of respiration. Remember that the primary muscle of respiration, obviously, is the diaphragm. But then, over time, we can develop breathing dysfunctions. In fact, breathing is probably the most common movement dys dysfunction that human beings develop. And so, what we'll do is that we'll actually inflate too much. We'll actually get too much air into a chest, into the lungs, and then over time, with too much air, we'll start trying to pull more air in on top of too much air. That's called hyperinflation. And when that happens, these accessory muscles of res respiration, like the scalenes, traps, etc., start trying to lift a rib cage to get more air into an already inflated system. So, Quite often, we will, as chiropractors, have a patient that presents with neck pain, perhaps it's on the right side, or it can be on the left, or headaches. And what can happen, the scalenes, as they attach from the cervical spine to the upper two ribs, will actually start pulling ribs up into what we call external rotation. So the lower ribs, will stay in a state of internal rotation on the right side in a normal human being. But the upper ribs will get out of sequence and they'll actually flip up. So we have ribs on this right side that flip up the first two to three ribs and ribs on the opposite side that flip down. Now there is a principle or a law called Friette's Law and the ribs actually will direct the spine. The ribs are like, they're like drive arms on the spine that will actually turn a spine. So in this particular case, above T4, the upper three ribs, we call that superior T4 syndrome, the upper ribs will actually turn the spine. And the spine will turn above T4 to the left, and that will have a consequence in your examination. So one of the findings you'll see is that if you take a neck, and instead of just turning the neck for range of motion, and most of our rotation is above C2, but if you take your hand and you actually start moving the neck as just one unit, above T1. This is what we call cervical axial rotation. This particular patient, and she has a kind of a narrow body, so she's a perfect candidate for this occurrence of a scalene to flip ribs up on one side that actually 
turns the vertebra above T4, she'll present as I stabilize the entire neck up to the occipital bone, she'll present with more movement to the right. But as I come over and switch hands, thank you Hannah, and bring your hand just straight down, as I turn to the left, I run into the proverbial brick wall. It's not going to move. How come? The reason for that is that the spine above T1 is already oriented to the right. The ribs, as I say, have flipped up on the right and flipped down on the left, actually turn the spine above T4 to the right. Therefore, as she lays straight down or on this table on her back, I'm going to be unable to turn her neck to the left because when she laid down she actually had to turn her head to the left just to look neutral. There's one other finding in this particular approach. When the ribs flip and turn the vertebra spinous right, body left, the right side of T1 will actually tip up. If you take a look at T, T1 on this patient, that right side of the body has actually flipped up to the right. What that means is she's already side bending to the right just to look neutral on the table. That's what's occurring in her spine right now. So if I take my hand and side bend to the right, or right lateral flexion, there will be limitation in her mid cervical spine. If I check the other side, she actually has much better side bending. And, and again, the reason for that, the orientation of the ribs that are affecting that T1 above T4 and the cervical spine above that T4, it's oriented on the right high, it's already rotated to the right, and that's how I'm able to determine the position of her spine which will help direct care. Now, directing care, does that mean I'm going to go in and try to adjust this spine to reduce the right side bending or to actually increase it? The first thing I'd like to do before I adjust this patient is to see if I can actually affect the diaphragm. Because if I can make a difference or get those ribs to flip down on the right side, that will realign the spine. We're going to talk about that in the next video.